I'm Valerie Florence. I run the grant programs for the National Library of Medicine, and I'm delighted to be here um, to um, welcome you to another one of in our series of s lectures by extramurally funded people that we're, whose research we're sponsoring. And so today's speaker is Dr. Matthew Scotch. He's an associate professor of biomedical informatics at Arizona State University. Dr. Scotch is also an assistant director of ASU's Biodesign Center for Environmental Health Engineering. He received his PhD in biomedical informatics at the University of Pittsburgh at one of NLM's training programs. Yay for that, right? And then he did a postdoc um, at Yale, another one of our programs, where he also got a master's in public health. Um, his, his NLM Career Transition Award um, really piloted in what he called an animal plus human surveillance system and its value for zoonotic disease surveillance. And then he followed this up with research on how best to enhance that surveillance and make it easier for state agencies to do this kind of work. His current work lies at the intersection of bioinformatics and public health informatics and focuses on genomics-informed public health surveillance of RNA viruses, as you know, because I know you read the thing that we mailed out to you, but I said it anyway. He has a particular interest in human and avian um, influenza. He's published extensively, more than 50 articles in, in very impressive journals. He's a council member for the International Society for Influenza and Other Respiratory Virus Diseases and an editor for Infection Genetics and Evolution in Scientific Reports. Um, he's been a member of the Medical Informatics Association for since the early 2000s, former chair of the AMIA Public Health Informatics Working Group. And I'm pleased to say he also serves um, as fairly regularly as a reviewer for grants, either for CSR or for NLM. The title of his talk today is Informatics for Genomics and Form Surveillance of RNA Viruses. So rather than keep talking, I'm going to let him do the talking. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ye, for uh, the invitation. It's truly an honor to be here and present um, uh, as part of the lecture series. So I assume I'll just hit some buttons and things will get going. First, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So a little outline. It's brief. Uh, I want to first explain the background of work we're uh, interested in, um, and then talk about the two NLM-funded projects, uh, one that recently ended on merging viral genetics with climate and population data for surveillance, and then the new one that was funded this summer that uh, we're excited about um, with the team uh, at ASU is looking at wastewater-based surveillance. Um, okay, so the background of my work looks at using informatics to advance public health surveillance. So what is surveillance? It's the ongoing systematic collection of data, in this case for individual health events, for monitoring population level trends. So what happens? Um, you go to a doctor, doctor is concerned about something, they run some tests, uh, the tests get uh, confirmed or... Uh, negated, and then if there's anything interesting, they'll send that information in the form of case reports to a state or local health agency. This is called passive disease surveillance. So what the health agencies try to do is answer who, what, when, where, and why. So who is infected, what were they infected with, when did this occur, where, and potentially why. And then the health agencies will aggregate this in a way that allows them to send to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention every month, and they'll send those uh, reportable diseases there, and they'll be able to look at trends over time, any areas of concern among different uh, geographic areas, and things they need to follow up on. And it's worked quite well uh, uh, in a lot of cases. But there's been recent outbreaks of uh, different viruses like Ebola in West Africa, we know about the 2014, uh, Zika in the Americas, that traditional passive surveillance is no longer sufficient for uh, this type of um, monitoring, and that there really needs to be an enhancement to this process through methods like molecular diagnostics, use of data sharing, so this I mean like digital epidemiology, 
uh, using data on the web to learn about um, like Twitter or people commenting that they're ill on, on social media and then using case reports and taking advantage of all those things. But then also the need to improve the use of pathogen genomic sequencing uh, during these outbreaks investigations so that we can actually look under the hood at the agent to determine what exactly is going on. So I love this uh, diagram. This is from Jennifer Gardney and Nick Lohman in Nature Review Genetics. And I love the presentation here. Uh, see if I can use this without um, messing things up. Um, so really getting at the heart of what it means to do genomics informed surveillance. Well, first, for example, let's say that you're uh, going to the field to collect some samples. Could be from a human, could be from an animal. You collect, like, for example, nasal pharyngeal swab if we're talking about flu. And then you use a sequencer, a uh, 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 next generation sequencer usually. Uh, these can be portable now. They're cheaper. They can be brought to the field. Uh, you can do, for example, de novo assembly uh, if you're not quite sure what you're looking at or if you have a very good idea what you're um, exploring, you can map that to a reference genome. Through the amount of coverage, you can look at uh, high quality variants to so look at how the viruses that you've sequenced are similar or dissimilar to one another. And then you can do some cool analysis like phylogenetics and phylogeography to look at how viruses uh, cluster together. Now there might be by this process that you identify that certain viruses in a given location group together as opposed to viruses in other locations, and that could get you asking specific epidemiologic questions about what's going on. So the cool stuff really happens when you can actually link that to traditional epidemiologic data about what, what you know about the cases. So for example, you can identify contacts and who's had contact with infected people. Where do they have contacts with people? When did this occur? What other epidemiologic relevant uh, information are you collecting as well? And then you can literally map the genetic information of the pathogen that they had to each individual case report. And through this contact that you have, contact reports, you can look to see who is in contact with who, what, how the pathogen evolved as these contacts occurred, and you can identify sort of issues with uh, transmission and make inferences from that. So almost like people talk about precision medicine and bringing genomics into uh, uh, personalized medicine for cancer, you can almost view this as, as trying to bring genetics into public health surveillance by linking genetic sequence data with traditional epidemiologic information. Uh, that doesn't work. Okay. So a big uh, uh, coverage of, the, of this type of work, of genomics informed surveillance, lies with RNA viruses. Why RNA viruses? Well, a lot of them are prominent of public health concern. Their evolutionary rates are much faster than other viruses and bacteria. Their often genomes are a lot shorter. So you can analyze differences in, of evolution over the course of outbreaks to make informed epidemiologic uh, inferences. So things like Ebola, we know about the 2014 Ebola outbreak. There's an Ebola outbreak currently going on in Africa as well. West Nile virus, we know about that. It started, uh, first discovered in the US at least, in 99, at least most recently. Uh, Zika virus, rabies, which is more of a concern among humans in uh, developing countries. Uh, MERS coronavirus, and where my interest lies in both seasonal and uh, avian uh, influenza. All right, so an area that we can uh, utilize in this focus of uh, genomics and form surveillance is phylogeography. So phylogeography sort of extends or is related to what you know about phylogenetics where you're trying to sequence, utilize sequences in order to infer how things are uh, ancestrally related to one another. Um, you can do this not just with viruses, you can do with, with this humans for, exactly, for example and, and other uh, species. But here in phylogeography you're ex extending this relationship to include geography as an important element in this work. So let's say, for example, you have three tips. We have three viruses here. One, two, three. These are represented in the tips of the tree. And then what you're doing is you're attaching geographic information to those tips, to the taxa. And this could be representing, for example, where the animal was found, 
where the human indicates where they live or where they think they were infected with the, the condition. And through this process, you're able to model the evolution and also infer, for example, the migration path of the virus along this evolutionary track. So here we have two discrete locations that we've sampled from, Arizona and New Mexico. And part of the process is estimating the, in, the unknown branches all the way back to the origin or the start of the outbreak. In this case, we believe it to be Arizona. So we can work again with RNA viruses because of what I said about their fast rates of evolution um, and their uh, shorter, sequence, uh, shorter genome uh, length. But the underlying data that we can work with often are DNA sequences that are deposited in databases like GenBank. Okay, so there's some, been some great work um, in virus phylogeography uh, that I wanted to comment on. Uh, LeMay et al., Philippe LeMay, in 2014, uh, used a novel method of a GLM, generalized linear model, which I'll be talking about uh, briefly, uh, to empirically show the uh, importance of commercial air travel on the global spread of influenza. Uh, Wallace and Fitch um, did a great study on the early spread of highly pathogenic avian flu H5N1 that started in Guangdong province in, in southern China, but then spread to uh, other provinces there and then internationally, but showing the impact on borders during that time. And then uh, Martha Nelson, who I think is here. Um, maybe not. Oh, there she is. Okay. <laughs> Never met before, but I think it was you. Um, did some awesome work on phylogeography of the different ways of the H1N1 influenza A outbreak in 2009 that people call the swine flu. Um, showing the impact of the importance of studying the different waves of the outbreak and how they can um, differ in terms of geographic spread. Um, so that leads us, that inspiration leads us to uh, the first project that was funded called Merging Viral Genetics with Climate and Population Data for Zoonotic Surveillance. So I want, one of the goals, the major goal of this project was to figure out how we can leverage this technology and these approaches to better integrate this science within traditional epidemiology without obviously interfering with classical epidemiology. So some of the questions that we looked at, what modeling approaches can be used to integrate disparate yet complementary data for virus surveillance? How can we better integrate genomics-informed uh, surveillance into decision-making at health agencies? And what are the informatics barriers to this process? So now that we've implemented this, or now that we've developed the flat, uh, framework that we wanted to, what are the actual lessons learned and barriers that we have uh, for implementing this type of science? And I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Sim, uh, who is the program officer of both uh, this work as well as the um, other work that um, I'll be talking about later. Okay, so the first question, what type of modeling tools can we use to implement this type of work? Well, as you probably know, viruses don't spread in a vacuum. At least I hope you know that. Um, what, health, what can health agencies do to curb the spread of infection? Their primary goal is disease prevention. Prevent, prevent, prevent. So what can they do in terms of interventions that might help people from getting infection or at least reduce the amount of morbidity and mortality that's out there? So they want to know what are some of the things we can do uh, to reduce through uh, issues like climate, uh, population density, and here I don't just mean human population density when we're talking about zoonotic viruses that can spread between animals and humans like avian flu. What do we know about, for example, poultry density? Or when we talk about arboviruses, what about vector control? There's also the importance of global travel, which was evident by the LeMay work in 2014. But what types of travel, from which place to which place? What about genetic factors? So we know that certain viruses, for example, flu and changes in antigenic sites can cause um, antigenic drift, and that uh, influences the accuracy of the vaccine. So what changes there do we have to know, care, uh, know about that would really impact or um, the, the virus's ability to uh, spread. So what um, the approach that I want to talk about is utilizing a generalized linear model to simultaneously quantify the importance of certain predictors on the spread of the virus while also estimating 
its uh, evolutionary spread um, among sampled locations. So it marries both phylogeography as well as what you might consider traditional epidemiology. So phylogeography, the data that we're using are sequences. You could take it from GenBank. You can make your own sequences. Uh, you can get it from a friend. Um, but they must have a known sampling location. So exactly where was the host found uh, that uh, was infected with a pathogen? And then for each of those sampling locations, you can assign certain predictors to those. So for example, what's the population density of each location in your model? What's the climate factors of each location in your model? What's the vaccination rate of the virus that you're looking at in your model? What certain genetic markers of viruses are you, do you care about? What's the proportion of those with or without the marker in each of these locations? So you take that and then you combine it within this phylogeographic GLM to simultaneously, A, determine the diffusion, the spread of the virus along the phylogeny, and then identify predictors that are both driving the diffusion but also could be suppressing the diffusion. And there's some examples of that. And hopefully some of these are actionable and at least lessons learned where health agencies can then prepare for future outbreaks or even address the current outbreak. Okay, so we wanted to explore this as uh, a way of potentially looking at uh, novel methods for utilizing phylogeography with the consideration that health agencies might be uh, interested in using facets of the GLM to better understand uh, drivers of, of spread. So this is done by Dan McGee, uh, a former PhD student of mine. Uh, we did this a few years ago um, in PLOS Computational Biology. So GL, the GLM model allows you to model the diffusion of a pathogen as a function of pr these predictors of interest. And you can choose up to 10 or potentially more predictors of, of interest for your model that you think are at least relevant. Um, and the goal of phylogeography, as you saw in that tree example, or one of the goals, is to perform what's called ancestral state reconstruction. So along those interior branches, can we estimate which geographic state the virus took or what it was transmitted to uh, along that path, and then ultimately getting to the root or the origin of the outbreak. So we want to, uh, there's different examples that can be used for that, and we want to know, is the GLM method better or worse than these alternative methods at trying to do this? So not surprisingly, we picked flu. Um, and we looked at H3N2, which is one of the influenza A uh, subtypes in 2016-17 season. And as you can see here, I broke the map up into 10 different regions. These represent the 10 different health and human service regions that the CDC uses to track flu at a national level. We found sequences for each of these regions for that year. But then we downsampled 25% of the time without replacement. And we did that six times so that we weren't biased by just one random downsample. So that created six different data sets of 285 sequences across those 10 regions. And then we explored these different models. Now, I don't have time to get into all the models. Um, BSSVS stands for a Bayesian Stochastic Search Variable Selection. It's sort of the common way of implementing this type of approach in a, a popular software that we use called BEAST. Uh, the minus BSSVS is not using that efficiency um, approach. The two different letters here represent just different prior assumptions that we had for the model to see if different prior estimate, uh, assumptions would interfere with that estimation. And then the GLM is our, is our use of the GLM approach. You can see here I have both SS, uh, plus SS, and minus SS. That SS stands for sample size. Oh, well, let me just iterate through there. Sample size. So sample size here is the number of virus sequences per discrete location. So for example, I had Arizona and New Mexico. How many of the viruses in my data set were from Arizona? How many were from New Mexico? Why do I want to add sample size as a predictor? Well, it could be that the actual collection of samples from each location is biasing the result. Just because one location has more sequences does not mean that there's more virus in that location. You have some resources that have the ability to sequence more than other resources, you want to account for those. You don't want the actual sample size 
reducing the signal of your predictor, of the other predictors that you're looking at. So we're trying to uh, explore whether this was actually biasing our results. All right, we had six different random draws. We had different uh, prior estimations or assumptions about the population growth. Again, not necessarily needed uh, for, uh, at this time. But. And then we looked across different metrics. We compared our, the GLM approach, I should say, both plus and minus the sample size predictor against these other approaches. And we basically did it um, iteratively, where, for example, here we're looking at roost date posterior probability. That just means, in a Bayesian sense, how confident is the model in determining what the root or the origin is of the outbreak, in this case of seasonal flu. So it's going to be uh, expressed in a Bayesian sense in terms of a posterior probability. So here we see, you can't see it unless your eyes are really good, um, the green and the blue represents the, our two GLM approaches, and you can see they're much higher than the others. And in that case, we're giving the check marks to the GLM for that process. And then we want to look at not just how confident the model was, or in terms of support, well, how um, consistent was it in identifying what the origin of the outbreak is? So here we had 10 possibilities for our 10 HHS regions. And you can see region four, which is the southeast uh, United States, was most frequently determined to be the origin. Not necessarily surprising given what we know, for example, about the source sink dynamics of flu in terms of going from tropical climates, if you will, to more temperate climates, um, at least studied on a global scale. Um, here you can see, though, that the GLM, out of 36 tries, was almost unanimous in identifying uh, region four. So for, again, we gave it uh, th that the check mark as well. All right, so we basically summarized that the GLM approach for phylogeography appeared to be better than the other approaches for the results, for the metrics that we examined. However, I bring you back to that notion of sample size. We did find bias that was potentially dampening the signals of the other predictors. And this should definitely be explored for future uh, issues with that framework for future studies. Again, the blue here are our sample size predictor. You can see the massive, this is the, the mean inclusion probability, basically the probability that it, our support for inclusion of the uh, support in the model. And then our regression coefficient is basically what directionality is a protective or um, supportive of spread, and they're both um, across all different um, population assumptions. They're all showing extremely strong uh, support for virus spread, showing the concern about sampling bias in this type of study. So again, our conclusion is the GLM is very effective um, at incorporating different predictors in our model and offers ad advantages when studying the evolutionary diffusion of models uh, of, of viruses, but you need to take it with consideration, this issue of sample size and sampling bias. All right. So now that we've explored some modeling approaches, how can we actually better integrate this type of science into public health practice? Again, that's my overarching goal as a scientist in informatics is to get health agencies using this, and uh, it's something that I'm always working at. So for those that know about health agencies, you know they are absolutely strapped for cash. right? So the money that they do get to spend on, it's on specific... Um, specific initiatives, whether it's a prevention program, whether, for example, uh, uh, if there's a novel outbreak of a disease, you know, money to just to track that disease and do active surveillance. They don't have a lot of extra money lying around to hire experts in biomedical informatics, right? So what is on them to incorporate genomics-informed surveillance is to try to utilize all the software that I'm utilizing on my daily basis and then combine it with all the other data that they're using for surveillance in order to make informed decisions with confidence. So the challenge is how can bioinformatics software and genetic sequence data, for example, GenBank, be utilized by non-experts at health agencies? So again, there, though, in order to do that, you have to extract sequences from different genetic databases as well as the metadata combine it with what the epidemiologic data you already have. So how do you combine sequence data in a public database with case report data that you get from a doctor? 
Not easy. What about other factors that you want to look at? Climate, transportation, socioeconomic, vaccination rates, all those things. So what we look to do here is to develop a pipeline that will help them translate sequence data into the information and knowledge that can certainly help public health practice. We don't want to interfere. We don't want to make things worse. It's sort of like uh, decision support systems. We don't want to make things worse. We want to support their decisions. Okay. So we've developed Zufi, and Zufi is really intended for people at health agencies, agriculture agencies, wildlife, when you think about zoonotic viruses, right, that are transmittable between humans. Researchers can use them as well, right, and we hope they do. And we have a link to our website. We hope you use it. Every time I give a talk, I hope there's people at health agencies there that, um, you know, learn about it and, and, um, and want to use it. Um, and we're also using it as part of an on-campus flu study that we're doing at ASU, which I'll talk about for the second project. And there's our cool little logo that we have. I, I really like it. I've had t-shirts made. Um, OK, so here's the pipeline. Again, think about have someone that's not an expert in this trying to do it and incorporate it for surveillance. First, you go to our website. You do your search, and you'll see that soon. You retrieve the sequences. You have to do alignment to compare them. Right? You have to know what alignment to choose, what settings. Uh, then you have to incorporate your predictor data into a file for modeling. We're using a software called Beast, developed by others. Um, Beast takes as input an XML file, which must be syntactically correct. Right? If it's not, the, the application will not run. Right? So you have to make sure that everything's there correctly. And then Beast is Bayesian. It's going to do its simulation through a Markov chain Monte Carlo process. And it's going to produce posterior estimations of the phylogeographic process. We're going to then, once that's over, sample across this posterior to get a representative what's called a maximum clay credibility tree. This is the tree that we have confidence is represents the phylogeographic process. We can then, if we selected the GLM, Option, we can show, visualize our uh, GLM results, and then we can also have some cool visualizations of spread. Okay, so here's a look at the website. Um, I based the layout of the website, at least this first part. I love the layout of FluDB just because I like the, the, if you've ever seen it, I like the little drop down boxes and things you can easily specify. So I saw that and I said, I, I want to sort of model it after that. So we have eight different viruses there now, and we can easily add viruses because of the architecture that we're using, and I'll show you that. Okay, so we have flu A, B, and C, and for all the flus, we have the different um, uh, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase options. Uh, so here we're selecting H1N1. Flu is a segmented virus, so you have to select a specific gene of interest, and we have tool tips suggesting, for example, for phylogeography, we suggest using the hemagglutinin hemagglutinin gene. Um, you select your host. It could be a human. It can be a non-human primate. It could be a mosquito. It could be a bird. It could be the environment, right? Whatever is there in GenBank that's been specified. You can select your geography. Here we're selecting Australia, uh, but you can select U.S. states, uh, provinces, not for every country, but for a lot of them. And then your time frame. So here we're looking at H1N1 in uh, Australia during its outbreak year in 2009. And you can even reduce your search by trimming the sequence length. So you could put that to zero if you want any single sequence you want of the hemagglutinin gene, or you could say, I'm going to specify what I think is the minimum complete coding region of that gene uh, in order to reduce the amount of data that I have to analyze. So here it gives you a little snapshot of how many sequences will be retrieved. Right? And then you look at the metadata here. We get our data from GenBank. So each row represents a GenBank entry, where the first column is your GenBank accession number. You can click on this here or this here. And this is a little snapshot that we provide you of the metadata fields in GenBank. But you can actually go to the official GenBank record if you want to. We have things like collection date and host and other things. And then we show you a little uh, heat map of where the viruses are found. We haven't done any modeling yet. We're just geocoding the results. So I did my sabbatical in Australia last year. So you quickly learn that everyone lives by the water. Um, so this is Sydney. This is Brisbane. This is Melbourne. That's Adelaide, Perth, and I think that's Darwin. 
Um, so not too surprising that we see a lot of stuff going on there. You can download the data. We're not going to hide the data from you. It's GenBank data. Right? So you can download the metadata. You can specify the columns that you want to study. So here I'm just taking date and state, and you'll automatically get the GenBank accession ID as well. And you'll get it as a CSV or comma separated values file. And you can also get the raw FASTA sequences. Let's say you just want to use this as a information search retrieval. You can take those and run them through your own pipeline if you want to. OK, on the last page is the Run tab. And you specify an email because it's, as I said, using a Bayesian approach. The Markov chain Monte Carlo might take a long time to finish. It could t I've had stuff run for weeks and months. Uh, to tell you the truth, we limit the size of the data set that you can do, uh, and we off also op offer you the ability to downsample in order to shorten your data set. Uh, you can specify the GLM option, and we have hard-coded data in there for you, or you can add a template as well. So let's say health agencies have their own predictors that they want to study. They can add those to the website. And then for you beast or phylogeography nerds, you can specify different assumptions about DNA substitution, clock likeness, as well as population uh, characteristics. OK, so we're going to send you the results once we're done. Um, and here, it, the first file is a tree file that you've seen before. The branches the, uh, represent the different discrete states where the virus is estimated to be at. And this is time scale. So we start here at the most recent, all the way back to the most recent common ancestor. Uh, the origin of the outbreak. So here, blue, and this is just quick and dirty, so don't, I'm not planning on publishing those results. Um, but uh, blue is Perth in Western Australia. You have two distinct clades here, right? And where the gold is representing uh, Sydney region, so one of the suburbs in Sydney, so you can see the spread from west to east across the country. And we also have some cool visualization that we want to show. Um, this is obviously not Australia. Uh, this is China. So I was looking at a paper by Gitas Dudas et al., um, who did a great paper in uh, science on uh, Ebola in West Africa during 2014. And I found in the supplemental they had this cool package for looking at visualization. And I said, I want, you know, I want to include that in the Zufi pipeline. So I asked him for the code, and I had my programmer implement it. So anytime you do a search, you'll get this movie file where on the right here, you have a phylogeographic representation of that uh, process, and on the left, the corresponding geographical uh, visualization of spread. So what do we know about H5N1? It started in Guangdong in about 96. The branch, the size of the branch circles represent the abundance of virus at that location at that time. And you can see that as it evolves, you have more provinces that are, have been impacted by the virus. And of course, what we know about H5N1 is that it's now a global, well, at least um, international um, virus where you have, for example, Egypt and Indonesia are largely infected as well. So we, we like that uh, visualization platform for showing our results. So what we're doing now is working on getting this integrated into health agencies by uh, sending the links out. What we hope to do soon is send the links out, get them to try it out, uh, get their feedback on it, and then um, ultimately I'd love to sort of do like uh, demos for them to get their thoughts and, and what they think of it, which is kind of part of the, uh, the next grant as well. So the final question I wanted to look at are what are the informatics barriers to leveraging this type of work? So now that we've done it all, right, what are sort of the lessons learned with trying to do things like this? So I'm showing you first the uh, backbone of the Zufi database. And you don't have to memorize everything here, but I'm going to show you three specific databases where we're pulling our data from. This, as I said, is NCBI GenBank. The raw data that we're getting are uh, the DNA sequences of viruses. Now, how, how many people here have used Gen, uh, GenBank? All right, great. So you know that it's not just viruses in there. Uh, but we're taking all the viruses anything that classifies as a virus. And we have an automatic process where every time there's a bi-monthly release, we're pulling the data. And we're getting new virus sequences that are added. And we have a large database here um, of all the viruses that GenBank reports to have. And then we have a smaller database of just the ones we want to make accessible through our web services to, from our website. 
and we're in normalizing this. So we, we know that when you manually upload a virus sequence, you have to put in the metadata for that sequence. What virus is this? Where was it found? Uh, when was it collected? Uh, what segment or gene is this? Things like that. And there's no necessarily a formal way to represent things, as we're going to get to. So how do, what are the challenges we have is how do we normalize it, all the entries in order to improve our ability to do information search and retrieval? So we have our taxonomic information that we get from NCBI taxonomy. And that's going to be for our hosts as well as for our viruses. And then our final main source database that we're using are, is geonames.org. Has anyone used geonames or heard of it? All right. Well, at least I know you're learning something new today, right? So geonames is a database that represents the structure of geographic entities that we know about. It could be lakes. It could be cities. It could be towns. It could be states and how they're all represented. We're using that as our geographic knowledge source. So we're going to have to normalize all of our records to that knowledge source. So I want to talk about that process. So this is virus metadata, and this is a submission I think I put in uh, for uh, low pathogenic flu for work I did with the USDA. Um, but you see I put in different metadata for the host. Anas carolinensis, which is your green wing teal. And then next to that is a, tax on, uh, a link to the taxonomy database. Who, who, what link do you think this is representing here? Any ideas? Yes, sir. It's the virus, correct. It's a link to the virus. It's not a link to the host, right? So there's no link to the virus. I mean, sorry, there's no link to the host, and there's no link to the location, all right? So segment four is just the protein that we studied. Um, so country is where you put, it's called the country metadata. We published on this, but you could put more than the country in there. Here we put the actual city, the county in Arizona where the bird was found, okay? And you could add your collection data as well. So there's no links for those. So how do we then normalize these two? So we have a paper and database on this by another former student of mine, uh, Tasnia Tassin, who just defended. Um, so here's our little pipeline for that. We start with a GenBank record. It all starts with the GenBank record. We use regular expressions to extract information from the host field. Here we have rabid domestic dog. We have a short list of common names of hosts. Rabid domestic dog does not match any of those. So we're going to try the taxonomy database. There is no entry in the taxonomy database for rabid domestic dog. There's proof. Unless they added one last night. Um, so what we're going to do is tokenize these, this phrase and then compare it to the taxonomy database individually. And we see for a dog, we have Canis lupus familiaris, which is your common domestic dog, one that I have waiting for me at home. Right? So that is going to be our normalization token uh, for that specific entry against the taxonomy database. And we did that for all the entries that we had at the time in Zufi. For geography, it's a little different, but we follow a similar path in that we start with the GenBank record. We first ask if it's a flu virus. Why do you think we asked that? Any ideas? Am I allowed to ask questions? <laughs> well, flu virus has a different structure, right? So in the strain name, you often have a geographic representation in the strain name of a flu virus. So uh, they're going to have information about the host, they're going to have information about um, the geographic location. So we know that that's important to pull from that. We also look at other metadata fields. So here we have country equals Finland. And then we look at strain, and we find we put those together. And it's Conovasi, Finland, which I checked. It looks beautiful, but extremely cold. Probably colder than where we are now. Right? So we take Conovasi, Finland. And I should say, there's a latitude longitude here. And that's actually a bad example. We could actually be done by just taking the lat long. But there's really, I want to say probably less than 1% of the records we looked at actually have a latitude and longitude coordinate in GenBank for these viruses that we looked at. So it's not something you can really rely on. So we then take Conovasi Finland, and we map it to geonames. And these are our entries that we have. And let's look at this feature class. That defines what each entry is. We have two Conovasi lakes, and who knows where they are? It could be in, there could be a Conovasi lake in Maryland. I have no idea. 
Um, then we have a third order administrative division, which I believe is like a city. Right? And then we have a governmental seat of that city. So our algorithm is going to take the least specific one, in this case a third order administrative division, and say that's going to be our GeoNames map. And we do that because it gives us um, probably the greatest um, opportunity to be correct if we take the least specific one. And then if there's a tie, if there's two third order administrative divisions, we'll take the one with the largest population. Okay? Right. So again, in this case, it had to be someplace in Finland. So the lake was probably in Finland, I should say. So we do that, and we get a GeoNames ID for each GenBank entry, and there's the one for this example. All right, so we want to evaluate it like any good extraction procedure. We want to see how we did. So we assign graduate students, willing graduate students, I might add, and we randomly annotated 100 GenBank records, or they did, for location and host metadata in GenBank. And then they um, answered any differences, and we had a third reviewer, and then we measured inter-rater reliability. And then we also compared it to MetaMap. So MetaMap... Um, which you probably know about for finding entities. Here, we restricted the knowledge base of MetaMap to just the taxonomy database in order to keep it fair, so we wanted to compare it for host. And we had pretty good inter-rater agreement, above 83% uh, for location and host, and then our accuracy was 70 for host, 87 for location. We missed a little bit in terms of where uh, domain knowledge was required. We were actually 7% more accurate for host for MetaMap, uh, but we were able to map two, over 2 million GenBank records to their GeoNames ID, almost 90% of the ones in our data set, and about 1.5 million uh, of the hosts to their taxonomy ID. So we had a pretty good amount of records we were able to successfully normalize. If you must, there's a link to the normalized database, and if you actually want to get access to normalized GenBank data, for host and location, you can do it through Zufi by our search retrieval form and downloading the metadata. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, geno genomics-informed surveillance, I feel, has great potential uh, for uh, public health use, especially of RNA viruses, which evolve very rapidly. Uh, phylogeography is certainly a domain that could help uh, utilize a lot of the data that's being generated by next-generation sequencing. There are modeling approaches that allow us to study the impact of certain predictors and ask specific questions and then quantify answers to those questions. There are resources that we can de develop as informaticians that will help translate this into practice at health agencies. But are certainly there are challenges along the way that we have to consider in terms of how we integrate all this different data, both within the resources at NCBI and without the outside the resources at NCBI that allow us to accurately represent this data and then imp improve our performance of information search and retrieval. Okay, so with the time remaining, and it looks like I have about 15 or so minutes, I want to talk about the newly funded project that was funded in June. Again, uh, uh, Dr. Sim is the program officer on that one. Uh, Dr. Rolf Halded and Dr. Arvind Varsani our colleagues of mine at ASU and are both PIs on this project as well. Rolf has a background in engineering, in environmental engineering, and Arvin is a molecular uh, virologist. Um, so it's a very, it's a very interdisciplinary, complementary project that we're excited uh, to get started on. So as I spoke about at the beginning, the current path of surveillance um, of public health relies on doctors and labs reporting information about sick or potentially sick patients. And that could be lab results, it could be clinical findings, and it's on the doctors and the labs to report those, right? Without those, it's hard to figure out what the heck is going on in the community unless you implement more costly and timely active surveillance programs. So there are many gaps in this problem, right? That you might have many patients that are infected with a virus, that are asymptomatic. What do we know about Zika or Dengue? They have a very large percentage of asymptomatic individuals, right? That, do, that doesn't allow us to understand the true burden of disease, or at least true burden of infection. Many are stubborn. They just don't want to go to a doctor. I'm sick, I'm going to lie in bed, uh, let me get some rest, I'll be fine in a day or two. 
And so they're sick, they need medication, or at least potentially need medication. Nah, they don't want to go. Then finally, you have laboratory tests, especially in-house labs tests that have low sensitivity. For example, the rapid uh, lateral flow amino acid that's used for rapid flu diagnostics has traditionally a low sensitivity. So if you test negative, you might not be negative. They might give you treatment anyway, but in terms of reporting it, you might you know, be incorrectly stated as, as uh, negative. There's, uh, we mentioned the underreporting. So you, the doctor or clinician might know, oh, I, that's on my list of reportables to send to the local or state health department. I'll get around to it later tonight, or I'll get around to it this week. You know, clinicians are busy people. Their priority is to treat the patient. It's not to send case reports to public health, unless it's like, oh, I just found Ebola, and, you know, it's something you want to do right away. So a lot of these sort of third tier, third on the, on the list reportable diseases don't get accurately reported, so it's certainly a, a significant amount of underreporting. What do we know about infectious disease surveillance? Early detection. Detection, 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 prevention, prevention, prevention is essential for curbing these, uh, these outbreaks. We've explored in the first part of this work non-traditional streams of data like digital epidemiology, like pathogen uh, genomes right? and, and, and sequences. And the focus of this project is consider another stream, wastewater. Right? So we know that wastewater has tons of stuff in it, not just waste. Okay? So there's viruses in there, there's bacteria in there, there's phages in there, there's drugs in there. Right? All of that can be analyzed and explored to, to determine what's going on. So what are the benefits of analyzing wastewater? It uh, can represent large populations without intervention, right? So we don't have to go up to people and poke them with a needle or ask for um, uh, results from a doctor for them or explore an EHR. It's there. The wastewater's there. We can just take it with permission. It can be near real time, right? So there's, once the data goes through the pipes, it gets filtered through, it goes to a wastewater treatment plant where it's then processed. It can explore, as I said before, symptomatic people and asymptomatic people. We can uncover silent outbreaks of disease that we wouldn't normally know about uh, if we didn't explore this method, right? All right, so what can we do now that we have the wastewater? We can use high-throughput metagenomics, and this is where Arvind Varsani's expertise in metagenomics and high-throughput sequencing comes in. We don't know what the heck is in the wastewater. So this is a perfect opportunity for metagenomics to utilize the algorithms and uh, lack of prior assumptions for identifying virus identity. And once we have those sequences and we properly aligned and assembled them, we can utilize that data, as well as any relevant metadata, downstream in using informatics to translate that into a signal that can then be used to look at trends over time in terms of outbreaks and the growth or um, a lessening of a particular virus or pathogen. So this project builds upon the excellent um, archive that my colleague Rolf Halden has at ASU called the Human Health Observatory, where he has created a significantly large network of sewage monitoring where he has gone out and contacted treatment plants and cities and gotten permission to have them send samples to him for both locally, nationally, as well as internationally. So it's not just ASU we're looking at. It's not just Arizona or the Southwest. It's not just the U.S. It's different countries, both Europe, Asia, and anywhere in between in South America. So we're really leveraging a lot of the samples and the networks that he's already established in this project. So that's one strength. So the overall goal is fairly simple. Can we develop a wastewater-based epidemiology high-throughput sequencing platform that will allow us to identify outbreaks, or especially silent outbreaks, earlier than they would be using traditional clinical passive reporting? Right? Is this applicable and is this advantageous for using at health departments as a novel data stream for monitoring pathogens in the community? 
All right, so how are we going to do this? Three separate aims. The first is to focus on the human health observatory that Rolf has collected and looking to seeing what the heck is in there, both 20 years over time of all the archived samples. And I was telling Valerie before, in our lab, we have a bunch of minus 80s with signs that say, do not open, uh, contains sewage and sludge and all that stuff, right? So be careful when you're opening it. It's properly frozen, but uh, don't get it confused with other things, right? So we want to look with what's in there and create archives and create a database that will show these novel new viruses and pathogens that are discovered in each of these communities and create a resource that people can uh, do uh, learn from. So we're going to use our human health archive, but also prospectively over the four-year grant, use fre uh, fresh water from U.S. international cities, and then for a case study, look at ASU as our for um, evaluation. Right. So as I'm going to show uh, in a little bit, this is going to produce a massive big data initiative for our uh, project. So the result here is just looking at nine samples from different cities. And this is part of our preliminary work that we've done. We looked at nine different cities. We used high throughput sequencing and derived de novo assembled viral contigs as well as full genomes, right? And we're able to find around 3,500 new, and this is just for DNA virus genomes, find uh, 3,500 new DNA virus genomes some are double-stranded DNA, some are single-stranded DNA, and uh, some are retrotranscribing viruses, right? But think about it. Just for those nine, nine samples, we had 3,500. Imagine over 20 years looking in the past, and then over four years of going forward with this human health observatory, how much data we're going to present from this work. So we're, um, it, it's going to be it's exciting and daunting at the same time. Aim two. We obviously big data. How do we handle all this data? How do we assemble it? How do you create pipelines that will process all of it and then develop an online portal that people can make sense of it all? Not an easy problem. This is where informatics again comes in. Right? So what are we going to do for that? First, we're going to develop an assembly pipeline for all the de novo contigs that have been generated from the high throughput sequencing. We're going to integrate it with other data that we know is already being collected. We don't want to just limit ourselves like, for example, we don't want to just uh, rely on one data source like ours. So here we're getting, anyone heard of the Joint Genome Initiative? Yeah. So we're taking metagenomic sequence data of viruses from that, and we're going to be integrating it into our own model. I think it's funded by Department of Energy, I think. I could be wrong. Um, so it's publicly available data. And then what we're going to do is, using that sequences and the metadata, we're going to translate us into a signal that can, or signals that can be useful for public health monitoring. Here I'll be using approaches from uh, population genetics and um, calculating effective population size of viruses uh, given the sequence data over time. And then, of course, we want to share our data and our information through um, uh, an online portal that will allow people to learn about trends, make informed decisions, and compare locations to one another over time. So you've seen this before. This is the Zufi backbone. And everything in green is new stuff that we're going to be developing for this project. So first, we'll be going to getting uh, reference NCBI RefSeq. So if we, uh, we want to be able to uh, match it to any known reference genomes. We'll be pulling in data from JGI of already collected metagenomic projects on viruses. We'll be developing a sequence assembly pipeline, and then we'll be developing a local blast analysis for uh, homologous uh, searching. Okay, and then of course we'll have our web services and mapping features as well. So finally, AIM-3 is trying to get at our, the main question that we're looking at. Does developing this approach, is using wastewater-based epidemiology, developing a bioinformatics platform to manage and translate all this, actually benefit public health detection of viruses, right, compared to traditional surveillance? Not surprisingly, I chose flu, um, but here, and we're looking at flu on ASU campus. Well, you might say, oh, it's just one campus? Why'd you do that? Who knows how big ASU is? It's the largest univer public university in the country. We have 
As far as I know, around 70,000 people on the ASU's Tempe, I can't say main campus, Tempe campus. Um, so that's a lot of people going to the health service. A lot of staff, a lot of faculty, a lot of students, all right? So we're going to be drawing from uh, samples from, from that clinic there, all right? And the question that we're wanting to ask is, can we identify peaks or signals before they're identified from the health clinic for re traditional reporting means, right? So this is the case study. We are going to prospectively collect nasopharyngeal swabs of patients being tested for ILI at ASU Health Clinic. So they, for anyone that's done it, they stick the nasopharyngeal swab up your nose. They'll use a lateral flow amino assay that has generally not great sensitivity. They'll swab it in some elution solution. We'll take that solution um, and bring it back to my lab. I have a little wet lab where we'll do some RNA extraction and some reverse transcription PCR. We'll uh, then send that off for next generation Illumina sequencing for assembly and pipeline. That'll help us to determine whether it's influenza A, whether it's influenza B, and potentially what subtype. We're then going to compare it to the wastewater. We're getting wastewater from Tempe, that plant that serves ASU. Okay? So we'll know that the wastewater that we're looking at there has come, or at least partially, for the most part, come from ASU. We're actually trying to go, um, I, can't, what, I don't know if it's upstream or downstream, uh, the terminology. We're trying to get even closer to exclusively get to ASU or not. And I had other jokes as well, which since I'm being recorded, I'll leave for after uh, analysis. Um, and then we're going to be basically do a data analytics to compare signals. Um, so what are we going to do? Very parallel process. We're collecting swabs. We're collecting wastewater. We're extracting genetic material. We're doing some sort of assay. We're sequencing. And then we're putting it in our Zufi pipeline. We're creating a signal, right? And then we'll do, for example, a cross-correlation function, asking the question, does the um, wastewater signal serve as a leading indicator, for example, as compared to the clinical signal? All right? And there's other things we can ask as well. And that'll help us get uh, to uh, address one of our hypotheses for this question. All right? So what we also want to do is, again, part of resource sharing and engaging with public health. And that is to provide our portal, the Zufi portal, for evaluation across multiple states, give them uh, some open-ended surveys, get their feedback, what do they think of the metagenomics aspect of it, the wastewater aspect of it, and uh, get their feedback on what they like and don't like, and then potentially help them uh, implement it uh, into their own practice. So constantly uh, um, uh, going to them and, and getting their feedback. So in conclusion, we believe that wastewater-based epidemiology and high-throughput sequencing is novel and an untapped area for public health surveillance. We think that it can allow us to identify silent or early outbreaks before they're identified clinically, or if ever identified clinically, that will hopefully allow health agencies to uh, intervene earlier and reduce morbidity and mortality. There's tremendous challenges in this work. It's, acts, it's development and management of big data, as I showed you with the analysis of those nine samples and the contigs and uh, the genomes that were generated just from that. It's access to treat, wastewater treatment plants in different cities. I can't stress that enough. How Dr. Halden, the impressiveness of getting access to 200 cities. Understandably, there's concerns from each of these cities. We're giving them access to their wastewater. What could we potentially identify in that wastewater that could make them look bad? What should we keep public? What should we keep private? We could potentially identify opioid use. In, we're not for this project, but we could, right, using, for example, mass spectrometry. Um, what would that say about a, a neighborhood? What would that say about a city? So he's done an excellent job of communicating, understanding these concerns, and getting access to these different um, samples. And then, of course, this is a highly multidisciplinary project. So how do we bring in the right personnel and training for this? You know, I'm hiring a postdoc from Africa, so I'm excited about him starting on this, helping me with the flu stuff. Um, it takes time to bring these people in, uh, visa issues, uh, but we're excited once we get everyone on board, we'll, they'll be able to contribute uh, along the way. 
So finally, I want to thank my colleagues, Rolf and Arvin. I want to thank Mark Suchard, who worked with me as a co-investigator on the first project from UCLA, my uh, graduate students, and my fabulous undergrads that have uh, brave, bravely joined the project um, at its early stages, and we hope to bring more on as well. And then, of course, I cannot express enough gratitude to the National Library of Medicine and uh, Valerie and her staff, Dr. Sim, for, for his support as program officer. Uh, and it's great to be here, and I'm happy to take any questions. There's my email if you want to follow up um, as well. Happy to collaborate on any ideas that you might have uh, going forward. So thank you very much. So you have time for maybe one question. Oh, my God, sorry. Or maybe two. <laughs> Please. So, I, uh, first of all, I think this is really cool stuff, and um, after this is over, I hope to talk with you about a variety of things. Uh, so one thing that struck me is that this is an idea that's been kicked around for about 20 years now. And people have always sort of done these pilot experiments and seen enormous enrichment for certain types of viruses. Mm. And, and not to pick on you, but your own data shows that same enrichment, mm. which is towards viruses that are contained in isocahedral capsids that tend to survive the vigors of these environments a little bit better and or easier to purify. So I'm wondering, in the last five, six years, people also said it would be impossible to directly sequence Zika virus, and somehow people are able to overcome that, the, to be able to sequence of high coverage Ebola virus, and people were somehow able to overcome that. So I'm wondering if there are any sort of things that have happened in the last 10 years in terms of the technical side of this experiment that have made this the right time to do it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think Arvin would be able to uh, give you more of an articulate answer about some of the specifics of that, but I can tell you certainly cost and accessibility is one. Um, there's, excuse me, still a learning curve for using a lot of these things, but I think, you know, even with, um, as you saw with the Ebola outbreak, you know, hearing about all the, the, the implementation of uh, the sequencing that was done there, the collaboration that was brought together. I think more people are aware of the importance that this type of technology has during novel, even during novel outbreaks um, in even resource-limited settings. So I think as, you know, and on the commercial side, when you have um, competition between different sequencing platforms, the ability to target, um, you know, the next great virus is potentially a, an interest of, of different technologies. So I think combining with that, is, there certainly is the potential uh, for utilizing this. But I, I, I see your bias in terms of targeting some of those specific viruses. Think about all the data that's been generated for flu uh, and for other viruses that get a lot of attention. While, uh, other viruses still of uh, public health importance receive less. Uh, but I think it's one of those things where as the technology gets better, as the costs get cheaper, we're able to do more and more. And then, as I said, hopefully the, the last barrier is where really my interest lies is how can we get this technology to be, uh, you know, at least the data of it uh, utilized at health agencies for uh, a way to supplement their existing um, surveillance platforms. But again, um, not sure if that answered directly your question, but happy to talk more about it offline. And that's probably what any other questions we'll need to do. I think we've hit our time level. Okay. And I want to thank you very much. It's fascinating work, and you're welcome to come and speak to Dr. Scott yourselves. Thank well, thanks you. a lot, and thank you everyone online that was uh, listening as well.